And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. Yo, Lord willing, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio, check it out. Yo, we stay quiet like Russell Buffalino when things will get ugly like Pepsi's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, Havana not turn. Light up a cigar and watch the spot burn. You'll get patty whacked. I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Rubber guys, rubber guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers. And hey, welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. We've got a big show today. First of all, we're going to talk uh, some news and notes. Then we're going to move on to a large Q&A. And then we're going to talk about Stefano Magadino. Uh, a lot of people have been asking for Magadino's sort of biography, so I decided that that's what we would do this week. Uh, it's probably going to be a pretty long show, uh, so if you're looking for just specifically one or two portions of this, obviously news and notes is just my opinion on things and, and some minor things like obviously the death of Sonny Francis uh, and a couple other things. Uh, but the first portion of it, f- probably the first 45 minutes of this will be a Q and a followed by, of course, the biography of Stefano Magadino. So check past the 55, 60 minute mark. Uh, if you don't want to listen to the Q and a, uh, for those that do know, uh, Sonny Francis died last night at 103 years old in upstate New York, uh, with his daughter by his side. I am not going to talk at length about this other than just to say, uh, he was a man's man. He lived to be 103 years old. He took place in some of the most infamous things in, in mob history and mob war. Uh, obviously, if you're listening to this on the YouTube page, I did sort of a three or four minute uh, description of Sonny Francis. Uh, obviously, there was a huge article that was written about him today, which we put over on the blog. I'll put the links in the description uh, for this show there. Uh, and we will talk about Sonny Francis at some point. He's he's definitely worth a show all to himself. Uh, so all that being said, we're going to get to a couple of things first. Obviously, we, we talked about Sonny Francis being dead, but I wanted to talk about something else. Uh, I got a delivery from... Uh, the federal government the other day uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, and I've got a lot of files on some things that are going to surprise a lot of people. Now, when is that going to come out? I'm not sure. And the reason why I'm not sure is because there are some things I want to make sure before I put out that legally speaking, even though the government uh, sent me stuff through the Freedom of Information Act, I just want to make sure that every all the the i's are are dotted and all the t's are crossed because i have some stuff that i think some people are not going to fucking believe uh some of it has been argued throughout the years of what the validity is of of certain documents and not but i've got my hands on a stack of about 100 pages which uh, i think i'm going to include in a part of my book that i am writing only because i think that if you say something is real and, and, you know, I could sit here all day and tell you something's real. I'm telling the truth about this, that, and the third. But when I publish the documents and a book, I, I think that sort of speaks volumes. So there is going to be stuff coming out in regards to that. Uh, but like I said, I, I can't tell you exactly when that's going to happen. Uh, but some of it is seriously, uh, I'm trying to think of the right words here to use. Uh, it's going to shock a lot of people. It's going to shock a lot of people because I guess people don't think you can't get your hands on stuff through the Freedom of Information Act, but you can get your hands on anything. You simply fill out the form and they'll send you pages and then you can pay for the extra pages and stuff like that. That's how I get some documents. I get other documents off Pacer, but I've got some documents that (laughs) are going to be very interesting. Uh including some of the documents I'll talk about now actually was documents on Frank Sheeran, uh, documents on Jimmy Hoffa, not anything that is blockbuster, not anything that's super huge. Uh, These are things that I think most people know, but uh, there is a part of a book I'm working on that that does talk about this to some extent. Now, that's not the big documents that I have. The big documents that I have, I'm not going to talk about. uh, But what I can tell you is, is this, is that some of the documents I have on Frank Sheeran, um, talk specifically about the problems that Jimmy Hoffa was having with the mafia. And, and I, you know, over the years, we've gone back and forth. Does Frank, did Frank Sheeran have anything to do with this? Did he not? And I think at the end of the day, I've often said I thought that Frank Sheeran had something to do with it. 
Uh, I did not realize how much Russell Buffalino played into all of this. I knew he was a part of it, uh, but there are some things the movie got wrong, things that I'm seeing now on FBI paperwork that make a lot more sense to me. Not that I'm saying the FBI tells the truth in any stretch of the imagination, but in this particular case, there are documents that lend itself to Frank Sheeran. Uh, and so my synopsis is going to be this is, do I think Frank Sheeran shot Jimmy Hoffa? No, I don't think he did. Do I think he was there? Absolutely. Unequivocally. Do I think he knows what happened? Absolutely. Unequivocally. Uh, there were wiretaps, uh, which I do have copies of, uh, with Frank Sheeran actually talking to someone who was an FBI informant and Sheeran says some very interesting things. Ralph Natale has mentioned a bunch of times in those documents and on the wiretaps, uh, and Frank Sharon wasn't just some knucklehead. A lot of people seem to think that Frank Sharon was a fucking nobody. I know that Natalie said he was a fucking nobody. But if you listen to these tapes that I have, uh, the, the reality is, is Frank Sharon was somebody a lot bigger than people thought. I'm not saying he was a made guy because he wasn't, but he did Russell Buffalino's bidding. Not only did he do Buffalino's bidding, he did Hoffa's bidding, and he put out hits on other guys using other people. Uh, so this idea that, that Frank Sharon was a simple nobody is really not the case. So what do we know? Uh, we know that Hoffa was pretty much outed by the mob, and they wanted him to just shut his fucking mouth. They had put Frank Fitzsimmons into the to the Teamsters Union and wanted to control him. They told Hoffa, we're going to bribe a president, we're going to get you out of jail early, shut the fuck up, mind your business, and Hoffa wouldn't do it. And what Hoffa ends up doing is he ends up threatening to expose the mafia. Uh, when Russell Buffalino hears about this, he kind of waves his hand at the idea and says, look, Hoffa's just pissed, he's blowing off steam, but, but in reality, he's not going to say nothing. But then there was something that happened right after that, and this is what leads down a very gray area and a gray path. Uh, there was a Time Magazine article that would come out about the CIA plot to kill Fidel Castro. At the time, nobody knew that this was possible, but somebody working for Time Magazine obviously got sort of a beat of information and ran with it. Uh, it's worth noting that Batista, who at, who at the time was in charge of Cuba, was very close to Russell Buffalino. And in fact, Bautista's children would spend time with Buffalino's family in the Poconos during the summer. They were very tight and very close. So this article comes out and it pretty much names Russell Buffalino as being a member of organized crime and being sort of the leader involved in the CIA plot to kill Fidel Castro. Buffalino immediately gets nervous and he gets nervous because one, he didn't want to be on the radar. <laughs> Two, he was worried about a couple of things, and rather than think it through, he just decides to take immediate action on the situation. Within 10 days of that article coming out, Buffalino orders Sam Giancana to be murdered. Now, a lot of people have talked over the years saying that that sort of uh, request or that order came from Chicago, and it didn't. Russell Buffalino ordered his death. They were worried about Giancana on the stand. They were worried about Giancana's mouth. They were worried about Giancana just making it too public. And because Giancana was involved in that plot as well, Russell Buffalino decided people had to go. He orders it. Giancana gets killed. Six weeks later after Sam Giancana is killed, Jimmy Hoffa disappears. Within the next year, Johnny Roselli is killed. So within a re relatively short period of time, three of the guys that were involved in the CIA plot are killed. Uh, Sam Giancana gets whacked. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa suddenly disappears, and then within a year from that, Johnny Roselli, who was the front man to the mob in the CIA, is found in a barrel off uh, Biscayne Bay down in Florida. Um, all three of those people could tie Russell Buffalino to the plot, and they could tie him to crimes, and Russell Buffalino wasn't going to have that. Now, the FBI, uh, on the record, through the paperwork that I have, named six suspects when it came to Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance. Two of them were Frank Sheeran and, and Russell Buffalino. It's worth noting that the way that this went down was the CIA reached out to Jimmy Hoffa to get the mob's help in the Cuban missile crisis, not the Cuban missile crisis, but the Cuban issue. Uh, and in turn, Hoffa would approach Russell Buffalino, and through Russell Buffalino, Johnny Roselli would become the point man in the operation. Uh, it's also, we got to mention that Chucky O'Brien, who called himself Hoffa's protege, had had issues with Hoffa in the last year of Hoffa's life, yet it wasn't bad enough that it didn't stop O'Brien from picking up Hoffa at the Machias Red Fox restaurant along with Frank Sheeran. Uh, and hence, Frank Sheeran and Chucky O'Brien drove 
Jimmy Hoffa to his death. Both Sharon and O'Brien were seen with Hoffa outside the restaurant. According to the reports that I have, and they're via the FBI, O'Brien was complicit, as was Sharon, but to who actually fired the fatal shot, they have no clue. They just don't know. They have suspicions. Uh, the FBI has alleged that while they acknowledge that Sharon o and O'Brien are were two of the suspects, they also name a third suspect who was a low-level associate in the Detroit Mafia. Uh, just recently, uh, Sharon's former attorney, a guy by the name of Glenn Zietz, had spoken out publicly. He's debriefed with the FBI, and he said that Sharon was, in fact, in the area at the time. He was, in fact, a member of the team that was involved in Hoffa's murder, but he doesn't think that Hoffa, excuse me, he doesn't think that Sharon was the one who fired the fatal shot, but that doesn't make Sharon any less complicit. Uh, six weeks after the Hoffa disappearance, Frank Sharon with other su suspects were questioned before a Detroit grand jury where Sharon took the Fifth Amendment. In 2001, Jimmy Hoffa's son said that his father would have only gotten into the car with Sharon and O'Brien and nobody else because he was terrified of Tony Provenzano. So that sort of makes sense. Uh, just things being chaotic and nervous and a lot of threats going back and forth. There's no way that Hoffa would have gotten in the car with anybody else. That combined with the witnesses that saw Sharon and O'Brien sort of backs up what Sharon has said as far as the location, uh, the location and the details. It was Sharon who said in his book about the car, he gave him the make, the model and everything, uh, all the information about that car he gave up to them. The FBI further backed that up in paperwork because they did find a three-inch hair that belonged to Jimmy Hoffa in the exact car and in the exact location that Frank Sheeran said Jimmy Hoffa was sitting in. Um, they also used scent dogs, uh, and the dogs actually picked up Jimmy Hoffa's scent in the car. So knowing that information right there, I find it very, very hard for anybody to tell me that Frank Sheeran wasn't there and didn't have anything to do with it. Now, does that mean he fired the fatal shots? No, absolutely not. But with Sheeran giving up that information and the FBI corroborating that information sort of tells you that Sheeran, A, had intimate details of what happened to Hoffa, and B, was likely in the car as well. That doesn't mean he pulled the trigger. So Frank Sheeran goes on to describe the house that was used on the hit on Jimmy Hoffa. He described the layout. He described the interior. Investigators ended up going to the house in 2004, and everything Sheeran said was visible to them from the way the floor looked, from the way the house was set up, from the rooms that were used. Everything that Sheeran said to them was identical. The layout was exact. Um, Frank Sheeran ended up taking people to the house and everything that he described was 100% accurate because see, the thing was is that the investigators tried to locate the house prior to Frank Sheeran ever telling them where it was. Frank couldn't give them an address, but he could visually point out to them where the house was, and that's exactly what he did. Uh, Frank further explained before they ever went in the house where the hit took place, and when the investigators tore up the floorboards and sprayed luminol, when they did that, exactly where Frank uh, Sheeran said that Jimmy Hoffa was shot. They found blood everywhere. Uh, the majority of the blood was found exactly where Frank said it would be found, which was adjacent to the front kitchen. Uh, investigators ripped up, uh, excuse me, uh, it was adjacent to the front door. Uh, then Frank further explained to them that Jimmy Hoffa, after he is shot, his body is dragged down the long hallway to the kitchen where there was a cleanup crew. Investigators then rip up the floorboards and they find DNA and blood all the way down the hallway. Of 50 DNA specimens, 28 contained blood, and DNA was only recovered from two samples. While the DNA, of course, collected was compared to Hoffa's DNA, it didn't match as far as being Hoffa's, but it matched as far as being male in origin. Um, so while we may never know who killed Jimmy Hoffa, like who pulled the fucking trigger, uh, I do think what we can deduce from the FBI files that I have and what, what's been said is that Frank Sharon was definitely there. Uh, he definitely had intimate knowledge of the hit. So I don't think you can, and he was proven to be in town and seen with Chucky O'Brien and Jimmy Hoffa on that day. He was also proven to be one of the six suspects they thought. <coughs> so the point I'm trying to make to you is, I don't think Frank Sheeran was full of shit. He might have been Frank. He might have been full of shit on the Joey Gallo hit. Uh, he might have been full of shit on some other things. But Frank Sheeran was not a nobody in Philadelphia. Frank Sheeran was not a nobody in Delaware. He, Frank Sheeran was not a nobody in the Union. Frank Sheeran was not a nobody when it came to Russell Buffalino. 
This was a guy who was embedded with Buffalino. This is a guy who had buildings set ablaze. This is a guy that had other guys hit and hurt with bats and pipes. He had other guys killed on behalf of the mob. So the idea that Frank Sheeran was a fucking nobody is absolutely unequivocally not true. Now, why people want to continuously make an argument by saying that Frank Sharon was a nobody, I will never fucking understand. I mean, I don't think really anybody wanted... Who wants to take credit for whacking Jimmy Hoffa? Uh, so do I believe that Frank Sharon pulled the trigger? Absolutely not. I don't think he did. Do I think he was there? Yes. Do I think he helped set it up? Absolutely 100%. Uh, you cannot take the movie made by Martin Scorsese and attribute that to documents that I have, documents that are published and certifiable testimony. You just can't do it. Frank Sharon was a guy you didn't want to fuck with, and that's the reality of it. Uh, so a lot of people want to bury Sharon and call him a liar and say this and say that, and this guy will come out with this story, but what they don't have is FBI documents that corroborate what Sharon has said. Now, just for a minute, just, just hear me out on this, is that the FBI fully believes for a fact, and not that I'm saying that they're the authority on everything, they believe for a fact that Sharon probably wasn't the shooter, but they believe that Frank Sharon was there. They believe that Frank Sharon led Jimmy Hoffa to his death. Jimmy Hoffa's children wrote letters to Frank Sharon begging him to admit he did it because they believed he did it. Jimmy Hoffa was very close to a couple of people, two of those being Chucky O'Brien, who just recently fucking died, and Frank Sharon. Jimmy Hoffa would not get in the car with anybody he didn't know. And if the witnesses that came forward and testified or at least gave the FBI their perspective of what they saw, how on earth can Frank Sharon be right about A, B, C, D, and E? How can he be right about those five things? That's not guesswork. Can we say that maybe uh, Frank Sharon heard stories and, and retold them? Absolutely, we could say that. But... I just think with the witnesses that came forward and said they saw him with Chucky O'Brien at the outside the, the Red Fox restaurant taking Hoffa to his death, so to speak, I just don't think what we I don't think we can logically uh, take Sharon out of the equation. So even if Sharon didn't whack the prick, he obviously had some sort of involvement. He's on record as being in the city. I mean, in multiple multiple ways. Originally, when Frank Sharon was asked about this and took the fifth, the only thing he said was he was attending a wedding in, outside of Detroit at the time. So no matter what anybody tells you, you could put him in the same vicinity of this. And then when you have the witness's testimony coming back and saying the same thing, there you go. So I, I think it's certifiable at this point. I think Frank Sharon definitely had something to do with it. But I don't think he pulled the trigger. Absolutely not. And I don't think it fucking matters at this point who who pulled the fucking trigger because this was something that was worked on by a lot of different people. This just wasn't one guy deciding to do this. This was a plot to take him out and get rid of him. I firmly believe that he's not buried in a farm. I don't think he was buried in Giants fucking stadium. The guy was fucking incinerated because you cannot have a body with Jimmy Hoffa. So I don't believe for one minute they're ever going to find that body. Uh, and I firmly do believe that uh, Jimmy Hoffa was taken to a fucking mortuary and, they, mortuary and they fried his ass. I totally believe they cooked him. Uh, that's the only way you get away with the crime. Jimmy Hoffa would have been high fucking profile as it gets. Uh, so th that's what I believe. I believe a lot of what Frank Sheeran has said. Uh, I don't discount anything. I have a hard time with the Joey Gallo thing a little bit. Uh, but I think as a whole, when you look at the whole story on it on its end, I, I don't think Frank Sharon was lying about a whole lot of stuff. I think he may have embellished a couple of things. Uh, like I said, I don't think he fucking pulled the gun and blew the guy's fucking head off either. But I think he was there. He just knew too much. And I think after 30, 35 years, whatever the fuck the case may be, you're not going to get a DNA hit on a fucking, uh, on a splotch, on, on a floorboard. Uh, if you look at certain, and I, I hate to make this fucking leap here, but if you look at the Green River Killer, he killed, what, f close to 50 women, all prostitutes. Uh, in the end, he couldn't fucking remember where he hid half the bodies, and so when the FBI and, and uh, the fucking Green River Police were, were looking into finding the bodies, even when they did DNA testing after finding bodies after 30 years, they couldn't verify who it was, and they had bones, so 
the, the the fact that DNA degrades and all of that stuff is one thing. But what I would be very interesting to see, see now is if the, the FBI and the forensic people have used mitochondrial DNA to test the hair and other things because mitochondrial DNA now is a big thing. And it's basically like saying, okay, we can take DNA from your daughter or your, or your son and then match that up against blood residue, and then there's going to be certain things that will match. So I don't know if the FBI has done mitochondrial DNA yet. That may be something down the road. Uh, but ultimately, do I think you're ever going to solve this? Absolutely fucking not. I just don't think it's going to happen. But like I said, I don't think Frank Sharon was totally full of shit either. And I've seen a lot of people arguing back and forth that Frank Sharon was a nothing, that Frank Sharon didn't do this. But that's all nonsense. Uh, do yourself a favor. Don't take a book writer's word for it. Research it for yourself. Look at case files. Look, get, Go to the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, request information. And they'll give you whatever they can. Now, most of the stuff, some of the stuff I have, not most, is redacted with black stuff because they don't want you to know certain things. And I get it. Uh, also, the FBI has like 10,000 files on Jimmy Hoffa. And they've only released not even a third of those publicly. So what I have probably a lot of authors have, but I don't think anybody's really ever come forward and just said, look, this is what I have on paper. This is what the FBI thinks. This is backed up by this person and that person. Uh, this is backed up by confidential informants, which that's a whole nother thing. Uh, the confidential informant uh, who was following Frank Sheeran uh, taped a lot of conversations that were very, very suspect. And there's a lot of things he knew about Sheeran that makes Sharon a lot bigger than a lot of people really know he was. Uh, and I don't think these people that write these articles and want to bash the film take the time to look up. They don't take the time to investigate it and say, okay, everybody says this guy's a fucking cocksucker, piece of shit, whatever the fuck. They just don't take the time to fucking look up the information. And I'm not talking about going to Google and uh, I'm talking about get the files, look at case files, look at testimony. Not to, not to say that cooperators are, uh, tell the truth in any fucking, uh, at, at any point. But if you can back up what somebody's saying with what's on a court of record, then it's kind of hard to bypass that. Uh, so all that being said, that's the little stuff that is sort of uh, coming out. And, and I don't think that people really realize that Russell Buffalino was behind uh, some of the bigger hits that took place. Uh, Russell Buffalino was no joke. Uh, but I think the, the one injustice that I think the movie did was they sort of played Russell Buffalino as a, a, a Joe Pesci is kind of a quiet guy. And he was, he's quiet, Don, uh, very, very quiet, very powerful. But the thing is, is he didn't whack Joey Gallo because Joey Gallo fucking insulted him. None of that's true. That's all bullshit. Uh, you know, Buffalino did things. Uh, you got to understand the political time with the Kennedys, with Cuba, and all of this fucking crazy nonsense that was going on. And Russell Buffalino is the one that made the call. Uh, so there you go. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And I don't think we're ever going to find out really truly what happened. But I think for the case that I'm trying to make is don't discount Frank Sheeran just because a bunch of other people want to say this, that, and the third. There is somebody down in Philadelphia, I understand, who is like putting stuff out, but they have no documents to back it up. It becomes a third person, fourth person fucking narrative, a fucking fairy tale handed down from this one, from that one, from this one, from that one. Everybody wants to make Detroit the, 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 the faction that did it. Everybody wants to make uh, Sharon the guy who didn't do it or didn't have anything to do with it. And, and I think a lot of that is because Frank Sheeran is not representative of what people think as far as being a gangster. Frank Sheeran was a fucking gangster. Don't get it twisted. He was a gangster. Uh, but I just think that just people have a tendency just not to believe stuff because they lack the fucking energy to just do research. You know, it, it takes one or two days out of your, your life to, to do research, to look at files and, and back it up with court testimony and see. And, and at some point you had to do a little guesswork. You had to see where it goes. So all that being said, that's where my stance is on that. I'm sure all of you are going to have a lot to say, but we are going to take a break when we come back. We are going to get to the Q&A portion of the show. Stay tuned. On a given week, I'm out of town a lot, uh, whether it's Philadelphia, it's New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, wherever the case may be, I'm always looking for a place where I can sit down and have a great dinner. Uh, ambiance is key, price is obviously key, but the most important thing is, is the food good? And there's a place I want to tell you about today. It's called Saltwater at Margate. Uh, if you are going down to the shore, because I know a lot of people in Philadelphia go to the shore, uh, especially Margate, you're missing out on a great restaurant if you haven't been there. 
Uh, the name is Saltwater Margate. It's at 9401 Ventnor Avenue, Margate City, New Jersey. Uh, the phone number there is 609-289-8078. You can also visit them online at saltwatermargate.com. This place is unbelievable. Not only is the food absolutely superb, the price is great too. Uh, they're renowned for their pizza and their gnocchi. Uh, they have all kinds of different things from mussels to roast pork and Italian fare. So do yourself a favor, do me a favor, go and visit Saltwater Margate. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it is a place that I think at some point, if not already, there's going to be lines out the door and around the block. So if you're down on the shore, stop in, go to Saltwater Margate. At least check them out online at saltwatermargate.com. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to start the Q&A portion of the show, but really quickly, I just want to say happy birthday to my friend down in South Philly. Uh, it's his birthday today. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, happy birthday to my buddy down there. You're a good guy. Uh, I'm very grateful for our friendship, of course. Uh, you're a stand-up guy as well, so happy birthday, my friend. All right, one of the first questions I got, I wasn't really going to answer because I'm not really a fan of dogging anybody, uh, especially when you know somebody is, is trying their best to do sort of a mob show, but there is something called Ruckus Radio. I am not a fan of that guy's show, and let me explain why. I have nothing personal against the guy from Queens who does it. I just don't think he knows anything about organized crime, and I think that if you're going to do a radio show, you should at least kind of know what you're talking about, and it seems like uh, in the dozen or so episodes, I, I kind of checked out just to see where he was coming from. He simply is going on Google, and he's reading like a New York Post article verbatim. Uh, he's not really offering you an opinion on the streets. He doesn't really, I don't think, know anything about the streets. He's just reporting news like anybody else. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I wish somebody that does that all the luck in the world. Uh, I had suggested to this guy at one point, you know, get a Pacer account, look up criminal files, get in depth with who these people are, what what the crimes are alleged. Uh, and maybe it just works for him to do it the way that he does it. Uh, but I'm not a fan because I don't think you're getting anything. You're basically getting a guy sitting in front of his computer reading an article verbatim in Newsweek or the New York Times or the New York Post, the Daily News, and that's not really telling you anything. It's And if look, if it works for him, it works for him, and I wish nothing but the best of luck for the guy, uh, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just reading articles, and I think that uh, if you're going to invest the time to really make money doing this for a living or if you're going to invest time having a fan base, then the responsible thing is is to know what you're talking about. Uh, and I don't think he could tell you the difference uh, in front of him if you went up to him and said, OK, who's Sonny Francis and who's Joey Marino? I don't think he could tell you the difference between which one was which if you put two pictures in front of him. But that's just my opinion. I, I'm not trying to trash the guy, not trying to be a dick. But at the end of the day, I think if, if you're going to do this, then you owe it to your base who takes the time to listen to you to teach them something or to talk about it. Uh, maybe he just doesn't have uh, the capacity for that. and Maybe he just doesn't know. But that's just my stance on him. And there's nothing wrong if you want to listen to the guy to each his own. I wish him nothing but the best. But I just think that it's lazy. And I just think that he's doing himself a disservice by not investing the time. Anybody can smoke a fucking blunt, sit in front of a computer and go, yeah, 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 reading it line for line off of fucking Google. Anybody can do that. Uh, and I know that a lot of the stuff that I do use comes from uh, the internet and stuff as well. Uh, but I always try, so I'm not trying to sound like a hypocrite, but I also try to tell you things nobody knows, and I try to give you a perspective from organized crime that People often, when they write articles, don't get into. It's always A, B, C, D, and E, but sometimes there's something between A and B that you need to know, and that's what I try to do, and I'm not comparing myself to anybody. And like I said, I wish the guy the best of fucking luck, but the reality is is that if you're just going to read an article based on a Twitter line, then you're really not a mob genre person. You're just regurgitating what's already been out there. So all that being said, let's move past that. All right. Uh, you've long had an understandable distaste. You, you've long had an understandable distaste for former arrogant New York police loudmouths, Joe Coffey. Uh, how and why did he justifiably merit high inclusion in your love hate list? Um, I don't know if you're asking me if I. I, I don't think I've mentioned Joe Coffey, but once. Uh, but if you're asking me why I don't like him, it's a simply like you just said. The the guy. Um, 
I don't typically talk about Joe Coffey. God, you know, God rest his soul. He is passed away. He's a jerk off. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but just because I don't mention him a whole lot doesn't mean I really like him either. Uh, he was kind of a big mouth Irish jerk off FBI agent who obviously uh, did not like Italians whatsoever uh, or criminals in general, which if he's an FBI agent, of course, he's not going to like criminals. But I think he was a little bias towards Italians in general. He just sort of kind of came off that way. Um, but what I never truly liked about him was his way that he would disparage anybody he didn't like. Uh, he could never find anything positive to say. And, and maybe that's the case. Maybe, maybe when you're talking about a criminal, there isn't something positive that you can say about him. But the guy just kind of came off as an arrogant piece of shit um, on every level. Uh, but I also heard a very interesting story that Carlo Gambino once put him in his fucking place several fucking times. Uh, but like I said, he was an agent, he did his job, uh, but personally, uh, you know, I kind of found him to be repugnant in every sense of the fucking, uh, what, uh, every sense of the word. All right. Um, second, a request that probably can't come true. The singular biography most anticipated would be Neil Delacroach. We have something coming down the pike uh, on that front. All right. Why did New York back Nikki Scarfo for a boss of Philadelphia? It seems... Um, Johnny was the better earner and more rational thinker. Uh, by Johnny, I'm not sure who you mean. Do you mean Stanfa? I, I'm not sure who you mean there. Um, and he goes on, surely they must have known that Angelo Bruno did not think much about Nicky Scarfo. Uh, well, actually, this is a really good question. Uh, you know, I've often wondered what the fuck Vincent de Cingigante was thinking when he, after Philip, you know, Testa gets killed, they, they sort of give it to Scarfo. Now, Scarfo had the opportunity to take over his boss prior to Philip Testa, but he declined it. Um, but I also think that looking back on it, if Vincent the Chin had realized at the time that Nicky Scarfo was going to be violent as fuck and just start killing everybody, I think logically he wouldn't have made that decision. But look, at the end of the day, Nicky was a no-nonsense no boss. And I think that the thinking was that Nikki just kind of sat back and waited for the position to open up, pretty much deferring to Philip Testa. I think, it, like I said, if Vinny had realized what Nikki would ultimately become, I don't think he would have made that decision. But at the time, Philadelphia was warring back and forth, and they needed it to stop. And I just think that maybe Vincent the Chin Gigante's thinking was, if, if we put the little fucking midget in charge, give him a fucking pen knife, let's just hope he doesn't kill animals and nuns. Uh, but unfortunately, Nikki ends up kind of doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but Nikki did keep shit in line. Uh, he got a little gregarious and got out of line as far as killing way too many people, but he did have the fear factor. Um, he, like I said, he went, he went beyond the scope. He went fucking nuts and started killing everybody. Uh, but I think the writing technically was on the wall, or at least on the board, when he had Salvi Testa killed. That, that should have been the sign that Nicky Scarfo was not dealing with a full deck. Uh, he was a couple sandwiches short of a fucking picnic because the Salvi Testa murder was unnecessary if we go on the logic of why Nicky Scarfo had him killed. All right. I'm sorry if you answered this already, but I'm trying to find out about what you may know about my uncle Frank uh, Lentino. Uh, Frank Lentino was a big figure in New Jersey. Specifically, he was the head of the Local 54, which is the hotels, restaurant, employees, and bartenders union. Uh, he was Nicky Scarfo's man in the casinos. From bid rigging to the unions, Lentino made a ton of money for Nick. Uh, and he was also responsible for the $600,000 per construction deal that he made on Scarfo Turf, which in turn sort of led to uh, Piedmont getting most of the contracts that were involved in Atlantic City. Uh, he was also the go-between Scarfo and Mayor Matthews at the time, and that basically ensured that bribes and extortion was handled exactly the way Scarfo wanted things done. Uh, obviously, I could go on for, for another 40 minutes with that, uh, and maybe sometime down the road I will. All right, was Salvatore Maranzano a captor, excuse me, a capo underneath uh, Vito Cachafero? Uh Here's the thing. I think he was, and, and I think that the reality is, it, it, and I, we're kind of going to get into a little bit of this later on in the show. We're talking about Stefano Magadino, uh, but basically he did send uh, Maranzano to the United States to take control of all of the rackets. And at the, at the time, most of those rackets were controlled by Joe DeBoss Massaria. Um, and also, who do you... Okay, the second part of his question is, uh, also, who do, you, who do you think made Luciano Castello and Genovese? 
Um, I don't know specifically who made those guys, to be honest, or even if they were uh, officially made. Uh, I would imagine that all three were probably inducted at some point just after or during the five points gang years. Uh, and we also have to understand the mafia pre Luciano didn't have the same structure whatsoever. So it, it, it may be a possibility that none of these guys were, were actually officially made. Uh, but if I had to guess, however, I would think that Masseria probably would have made Luciano as well as Costello and Genovese. All right, who would play Vincent the Chingigante if they did a film based on him? Uh, Chaz Palminteri. I know that Vincent D'Onofrio played Vinny the Chin uh, in the, oh God, the, what the fuck was it? The, 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 the horrible, awful fucking Frank Matthews stuff, I think it was. Uh, but no, for, for my money, Chaz Palminteri would, would definitely be uh, a good Vinny the Chin, in my opinion. All right. Did the FBI ever play any wiretaps to Henry Hill stating that Jimmy Burke and Paul Vario were going to whack him during his arrest? Uh, I have read, uh, I have read over the years myself that the FBI has never played any tapes to Henry Hill. So a lot of this has always been Henry Hill's word versus everybody else's. Um, Look, Henry Hill is a notorious liar. However, this one I kind of, you know, uh, I sort of believe. Um, I don't believe that an agent played Henry Hill a tape whatsoever. What I do believe is I believe that he knew his time was up as Jimmy Burke was going to fucking kill him. Uh, Henry had repeatedly gotten sloppy. He was using drugs, selling drugs, and that put his crew sort of on the map of being monitored. Uh, he had outgrown his usefulness like I said, got sloppy. And therefore I think it was more subjugation on Hill's part, to be honest with you. It gave him an excuse as to why he ratted, why he ran. Uh, but no, I don't think the FBI ever went to him and played him wiretaps. I think if that had been the case, you would have seen Henry Hill go in and run into the FBI's arm, smooching them on the neck immediately. Uh, I just think that Henry Hill knew his days were over. All right. I don't know if you know this question, but when the Russians are made, do they go through the same thing the Italians do with poking the finger, pricking the finger, putting a card in your hand? And what do you think about the Irish? Do they do similar things to be made? To my knowledge, the Russians may have a tiny ceremony, but it's nothing like the Italians. Um, the Irish, to my knowledge, don't really have a making ceremony either. However, the difference in these groups is that with the Russians, you got to kill somebody to get involved. Uh, with the Irish, you have to be able to earn and you've got to kill. Uh, the Italians used to be that way. The only way you could get inducted was you had to murder somebody. But those sort of rules changed a long time ago. What are your thoughts on the baseball scandal and how do you think... Uh, your beloved Red Sox will do this year as far as the mob's reach in the NFL on fixing games? And do you think the mob has some refs uh, in their back pocket? And can we get a Ron Previty? Ron Previty sighting. Um, you know, I don't know. Look, baseball, yes, I am a Red Sox fan, obviously. Uh, listen, I don't think them sealing steins, steins, I don't think them sealing, stealing signs is a bad thing. I think every team in the league does it. It's just a matter of who gets excuse me, caught doing it, right? So we know through the NFL, the Patriots have been cheating for years. Uh, if you're a Patriots fan, go fuck yourself. That's how I see it. I fucking hate the Patriots. I always will hate the fucking Patriots. They have cheated. They have done things. They've gotten caught for things. And they sort of get a slap on the fucking wrist. And a lot of the problem is the NFL knows marketing. And they know that the, the, the fucking Patriots are one of the best teams in football. And they get the most jersey sales and all this kind of fucking nonsense and the revenue that comes in. So the NFL is only going to slap them, but so fucking hard, right? Uh, in terms of the Red Sox, I don't think it's been proven yet that the Red Sox cheated. But if they did, so fucking what? Everybody does. Everybody fucking cheats in baseball. I don't give a fuck who you are, what you say. Every single one of them steals signs. Why do you think teams all hire people to sit in the fucking stands and watch with binoculars? That's been going on since baseball started. I don't think it's ever going to stop. How do the how do the how do the Red Sox do this year? I, I'm not sure. We're gonna have to see what the off season brings. Uh, but I, I don't think this is just a, an Astros problem, and I don't think it's just a, a Red Sox problem. Uh, as far as the mobs reach into fixing games, I really don't know if that's really the case anymore. Uh, the NFL, I don't think that's the case. I think we can go back to like the, the 80s and the 70s, and I think that would have been the case. But I, I just don't think the mob has that kind of power and strength anymore. I could be wrong. Uh, as far as Ron Previty, Ron Previty, I think he was seen having dinner with Ralph Natale and sucking his gums. I don't know. All right. 
having listened to Gravano's interview with Patrick Bet David again, I wanted your opinion on a claim that Scarfo offered his help to take out John Gotti. Do you think uh, Scarfo was under the Genovese umbrella and that this was maybe an indirect offer from them uh, to handle Gotti? Uh, here's my thing. I've thought about this a lot. I don't necessarily typically believe everything Sammy Gravano says. I've said it before. I think 50% is honest. 50% is bullshit. Uh, do I think Nikki Scarfo called him on the phone in the middle of the night in some cloak and dagger fucking meeting and asked Sammy Gravano to go down there because he wanted to talk about killing John Gotti? No, I don't buy any of that. I don't think it ever happened, uh, at least not in that extent. I don't know why uh, Nikki Scarfo would even want to involve himself in that fucking nonsense uh, unless Nikki Scarfo saw a way to make money. Uh, it's long been asserted, at least from the FBI, that Philadelphia is very close with the Genovese crime family. They're very tight. Uh, I do not know if that's the case, to be honest with you. I know that they're, they're I, I can tell you this. They're not close with the, the Gambinos. I can tell you that much. Uh, but I don't think I really necessarily believe that, that Scarfo offered to take out Gotti if they did meet. Uh, then I'm sure that, that, that Scarfo's true motive for having Sammy Gravano come down and see him had to do with money, uh, be it construction, because, of course, Nicky Scarfo wants to make money, right? And, and Gravano was a superstar is, is, with high-earning capabilities, so why not you know, talk to him and buddy up and see if they can make money? But do I think that a, a boss of another family would tell another uh, an underboss of a family, hey, I want to kill your fucking boss? I just don't think that's the case. Uh, and if that was the case and Gravano didn't tell Gotti, then what does that say about Gravano? Then he obviously at that point wasn't loyal to Gotti. So there's a lot of different things that we can kind of to to believe when it comes to that. Uh, I can tell you for certain that Sonny Francis wanted John Gotti Jr. killed. Uh, it didn't like John Gotti Sr. There's a lot of people that didn't. But that's just there's a lot of politics in that. Uh, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, I, I don't think Nikki Scarfo ever helped to kill John Gotti at all. I, I don't I just don't buy it. Now was Nikki crazy enough to say that kind of shit? Sure. And, and kind of get a, a pulse or a beat off Gravano? Absolutely. But I just don't think it ha happened that way. All right. Um here we go. Uh Luna Local two ten based in Buffalo was high, heavily influenced by organized crime in the early nineties. Uh the FBI or the biggest joke organization in America declared the union they declared that the union was free of organized crime corruption. However, I'm skeptical of that. Do you know if there's still mob influence and in Local 210 in Buffalo? Absolutely, 100%. They still have influence in Local 210. However, it's not what it once was. But any suggestion by the FBI that the mafia is no longer involved in union work in Buffalo is laughable. Absolutely laughable. How do you think the mob would have looked if, if Joe Bonanno would have killed the commission in 1963? Do you think there would have been a Gotti or Gravano? Do you think the Chin would have had as much power as he did? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, you know, obviously we're never going to know, and we know what happened to Joe Bonanno as a result. We're going to talk a little bit about that today when it comes to Stefano Magadino, who was Joe Bonanno's uncle. Um, I think what would have probably happened, Bonanno would have tried to take over the whole mob he would have probably, instead of gone from five families, he would have converted it to one. I think that's probably what he would have done. That was his ego. Uh, wouldn't have been a bright move, uh, but would there have been a, a Gotti or a Gravano? Uh, Gotti never his boss. I don't think that ever would have happened if Bonanno had succeeded in doing what he did. Uh, Gravano, I think, still would have been Gravano because you've got to understand Gravano's roots and how he began. Uh, he was not originally a, a Gambino guy. He, I believe it was a, he was a Colombo guy. Uh, and so that's the whole thing. He came up under the Columbos and then went to another crime family. Um, would Vinny of Chin had as much power? Uh, probably not. Probably not. But we'll never know. All right. Do New York guys have it worse as far as FBI units cracking down uh, than any other city? Or do smaller families around the country have it worse because it's not on the same scale as New York and not as much happening? Or do you think... Uh, that helps smaller families. I think smaller cities have it worse, to be honest with you. Uh, in a large city like New York, you could disappear a bit easier than, say, like Philadelphia or Providence. Yet, at the same time, I can kind of also argue that a bigger city with more eyes can be tougher. I just think there's more rackets and more of a vast area in New York and L well, not L.A., obviously, but New York. Uh, I think smaller cities have a tougher time. I mean, they're fighting over 10, 20, 25, 30 rackets. 
Um, and there's a lot of eyes on, on smaller factions. Uh, but I can, I can argue it either way. Um, I mean, I mean, I guess it becomes, do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or do you want to be a smaller fish in a big pond? There you go. All right. In your opinion, what crew is the biggest in mob history and which families were always considered glorified crews and what is considered a glorified crew? Uh, I don't think any families have ever really been considered glorified crews. Uh, maybe, maybe Los Angeles uh, at one point was a glorified crew. Uh, Baltimore glorified crew. Uh, Springfield, Massachusetts glorified crew because all Springfield is is a sub a sub a sub direct of the Genovese crime family. Um, so I, you know, I think. Listen, I, the biggest crew I, is Murder Inc. They got shit done. Murder, Inc. was a big crew, and they got shit done. All right, I finally got around to watching The Irishman. Several times, Russell Buffalino was referred to as McGee. I've never heard this name referenced to him before. Was it an inner circle thing, or did I just miss the boat? Nope, it was pretty much an inner circle nickname. Uh, how he really got that, I don't know. I wish I did know that, but I don't know. All right, in history, when a guy or guys come from a family... Okay, in history, when a guy or guy's family has a rat is it held against the family or is there just or is there just resentment towards the guys who told um is there a reluctance to work with some families as a result of a lot of rats or will the almighty dollar make anyone work together i think historically at least in the last 25 years the bananos have been a tough family to work with because they've had so many informants and it makes the guys a lot uh, more weary guys still from other families work together but it's a lot less than it used to be um but it, look it used to be if anybody in your bloodline was a rat or informant nobody else in your family could be ever be a part of the mafia you were a pariah uh, and they wouldn't have anything to do with you also the same thing could be said if you were ex-law enforcement it used to be if you were related to anybody in law enforcement or you were an ex-cop you couldn't be in but i guess it really depends on which boss individually thinks uh, but I also think we've seen in the past that there is always, you know, more than one from the same family. So in my opinion, uh, what one guy does shouldn't affect the other. But at the same time, I think you control more of the narrative if you follow the code and you just don't let them be around. Uh, we've seen that in a plenty of cases. All right. Have you ever been to the Organized Crime Museum in Vegas? No, I haven't. Uh, who is your favorite consigliere? Uh Ones that never made boss that could have been great. Tony Salerno. I mean, technically he was a front boss, but uh, Neil Della Croce, hands down, was pro would probably have been the most ferocious consigliere I've ever seen in my life. Uh, there is one other guy, but I can't mention his name. All right, what do you think? Big. What do you think if Big Paul would have had John Gotti as his underboss instead of Tommy Bellotti? Do you think Gotti still goes after Paul, or do you think Paul still gets killed by Gotti? What are your thoughts? Uh, look, Gotti was not liked by Paul Castellano whatsoever. Paul Castellano didn't like him. He didn't like his attitude, uh, but he was stuck with him, right? Um, Paul, Paul didn't have a lot of respect for Gotti and Gotti didn't respect Paul. So I think that kind of went back and forth. So therefore, you know, I don't see a situation where Gotti could have legitimately gotten the position naturally. There was no way that Paul was going to make him an underboss. There was no way that Paul was going to allow him to succeed naturally. Uh, so I don't think Gotti really had much of a choice. But by my account, I think that Sammy Gravano had more earning capability and was more violent. And that's a role that that I think that Sammy Gravano would have established on his own. Uh, if Sammy Gravano doesn't become a rat, I think ultimately Sammy Gravano would have taken over the Gambino crime family. That's just the truth. I, I think he was smart. I think he was tough. Uh, and I think he would have been a good boss. But unfortunately, you know, we will never know how that works. Uh, Joe Piney Armone would, would would be another one. Hell of a, hell of a, hell of a guy. Uh, also the Carrazos too. The Carrazos too. All right. Uh, did you ever do a show on Dominic Mimi uh, Schiavo? Um, and what was the reason for him being killed? Uh, I haven't, but I will. Uh, and, and Mimi was actually killed for a lot of different reasons. One of them being that he was a fucking drunk. And anytime he got drunk, he created a lot of problems. He actually insulted Carlo Gambino uh, at a lounge, calling him an old fuck, and then literally looked at him and said, who the fuck do you think you are? That's probably enough to get the motherfucker killed right there, to be honest with you. But he ended up causing some problems with Greg Scarpa, which in turn infuriated Carmine Persico. The reality is, is that probably Scarpa used uh, Mimi Schiavo against Persico 
to get him out of the way. And I think that's ultimately what happened. But it was a, it was a pawn and a power move by Scarpa, uh, which if you look at Scarpa's history with Persico, he consistently did that kind of stuff. Uh, but just insulting Carlo Gambino alone should have gotten him killed. All right. Uh, who would be more powerful, Nick Savella of Kansas City or Sam the Plumber? Uh, and can we get a Sam the Plumber show or Nick Savella show? Uh, yes, uh, Nick Savella. Uh, you know, the, the problem with Sam the Plumber is he didn't particularly like New York gangsters. He didn't like anything about New York. He consistently was caught on wiretaps talking shit uh, specifically about Carlo Gambino. Um, you know, Kansas City fell in line sort of where Jersey did. They, they did their, their kind of their own things uh, most of the time. Uh, and I think there was also resentment because New York logistically had members in New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey was never really allowed to have their own turf. They weren't allowed to have their own territory uh, because there's representation from all five families within New Jersey itself. Uh, and so there was probably some resentment on New Jersey's behalf, especially Sam's behalf. Um you know, it's like telling New Jersey they can only have a handful of Halloween candy and then they're told they stop. They can't eat no more. Uh, you know, when when you put the, the vice grip on a crime family and tell them you're only going to be able to do certain things, it, it presents problems. All right. Uh, is this right to say that Philly and Nettie was the power behind Nikki Scarfo? Sammy the Bull was the power behind John Gotti and Neil, Neil Delacroach was the power behind Carlo Gambino. Uh, no, no, and no. Uh, Phil Leonetti, look, you know, uh, piece of shit, scumbag, fucking rat, jerk off, degenerate, bum, that guy. Uh, but, you know, Leonetti would have people killed, uh, basically on Nikki's orders. Uh, and Nikki could have done that all on his own. He didn't need Phil Leonetti to go do that for him. Uh, but I do wonder. Um, if Nick would have been as wealthy without Phil Leonetti, because I think that's one of Leonetti's strong points was he had the backing of his uncle Nick, uh, and Leonetti was able to put together a lot of money uh, for Nicky. So I don't think that Nicky's I don't think Nicky's power came from Phil. I think that the uh, the backing of Vincent the Chinchigante gave Nicky Scarfo a hell of a lot of power, uh, and the fact that Nicky Scarfo was willing to just kill fucking anybody. Uh, but I don't think Lee and Eddie was the power behind him whatsoever. Uh, Sammy the Bull Gravato absolutely was the power behind John Gotti. Hands down. Without Sammy Gravano, Gotti would have never been successful as boss. And that's the fucking truth. Gotti didn't know how to earn a fucking dime. Gotti was a degenerate fucking gambler. Everybody knows this. That's the truth. Uh, Sammy Gravano was an earner and he took care of people and had them killed. Basically, he had people killed. Uh, people were killed on Gotti's orders, of course. But Sammy the Bull Gravano kept everything sort of in line. Without Gravano, Gotti never makes the kind of money. Without Gravano, I don't think Gotti could have taken over the crime family. I just don't see it being true. Uh, Neil Delacroach was not the power behind Carlo Gambino whatsoever. Uh, Neil and Carlo never trusted one, one another after the hit on Albert Anastasia. And the reason why is Neil was under Anastasia. He did not agree with how Carlo Gambino took over. Uh, in fact, at one point, Gambino was scared that Neil Della Croce might get, try to get some sort of retribution uh, for Albert Anastasia getting killed. But ultimately, Neil falls in line and just agrees the boss is the boss is the boss. Uh, but no, Carlo could have kept doing what he was doing without Neil Della Croce. Uh, that Della Croce is definitely not the power behind Gambino. Not at all. <coughs> all right. Who do you believe is the most violent member of Murder, Inc.? Uh, it's going to be a toss-up probably between Albert Anastasia, Dutch Schultz, Louis Lepke. I mean, those three by themselves, Christ. Uh, probably Dutch Schultz, hands down, of that bunch. Is Sonny Francis retired or is he still active? To my, well... First of all, God rest his soul. He died late last night, and he was still active as far as I know. All right. How was Vinny Ocean his boss pre-ratting and Witsec, and did he ruin the D. Cavalcante's power? Uh, many don't know this, but Tony Soprano was actually based off Vinny Ocean. I know a lot of people say that that's not accurate, but that is accurate. Uh, I don't think he ruined the DeCavalcanti power base, to be honest with you. I mean, there was already a war brewing between factions, uh, Charlie Majuri being one of the bigger problems because he felt that he should be named boss after Jake Amari died. Uh, then John the Eagle Riggy takes over, excuse me, John Riggy while he's in prison, sort of restructures the family into a panel so that everybody kind of has a fair power balance and that there wouldn't be a power vacuum. Uh, it was split between Majuri, Vinnie Ocean, and, and uh, 
Vinny Palermo. Uh, but the move infuriated Charlie Majuri. Majuri would attempt to recruit Gallo to kill Palermo. Uh, the move didn't work as Gallo ends up notifying Palermo. Palermo then, in turn, wanted to kill Charlie Majuri. Uh, and Majuri was not well liked. Uh, he was repeatedly, he caused friction in the unions by forcing out people he didn't like, and he would take their money and rob them, and a lot of people didn't like the way he behaved, but the entire thing hurt the decavalcantes and sort of fractured them uh, and split them up. But ultimately, Vinny would, you know, obviously take over, but then in 1998, the world uh, dumped all over Vinny Ocean. Uh, Ralph Garino would end up be- becoming an informant, and then that would sort of signal the roadmap for disaster for the Cavalcanti crime family. All right, why haven't they made a Lucky Luciano movie yet, and why isn't Joe Adonis talked about a lot? Uh, I'm not sure because, you know, usually historical mob movies are the best movies, um, and I think a Luciano film would be really good. But I don't know how popular it would be. That's sort of the sort of the problem. I know with, with there have been other movies that have sort of talked about him, but a Lucky Luciano film all about himself would would be interesting, I think. Uh, and look, they don't talk about Joe Adonis because a lot of people don't know who the guy is. Uh, people tend to focus on Gotti, Capone, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they just don't have any knowledge outside of the names that that are constantly regurgitated through the media. Uh, has Anthony Comello lost, lasted longer than people may have thought he'd last? Uh, no, I still think Anthony Comello, who is the one who killed Frank Cali, still has a date with death. He's still going to get killed in prison, uh, deservedly so. Uh, it's coming. It's just, you know, it, it, it's it's not going to happen while he's in PC, and PC meaning protective custody. Uh, I don't think there's any way that Anthony Comello survives uh, what he did, and rightfully so. All right. Uh, is it true the mob, is it true that Meyer Lansky gave information on Frank Matthews and do you think he's still alive? Uh, Lansky would not need to give information on Frank Matthews to anybody because the mob already knew who Frank Matthews was. Uh, and I don't think Frank Matthews is alive. I, I think he's dead. I think he's been dead for a long time now. Uh, as you know, Frank Matthews wanted to cut the, uh, the, the Italian mob out of the drug trade, uh, sort of got every all the, the drug dealers together in Atlanta and, and talked about killing everybody. And obviously they all thought he was fucking nuts. Uh, and that never happened. All right. Is there any known mob activity in New Hampshire? Uh, I talked about this last week. Go back to last week's show. Are there still any mob social clubs in existence? Yes. And I hang out at several. That I, that, that I will tell you. They're, they're there. I've been to some. Uh, they're still there. It's not like it was back in, say, the 50s and 60s. But, yeah, they're still there. Uh, mostly they, they become cafes at this point. Uh, but there's always, you know, guys in there. All right. What are your favorite mob hits? Um, let's see. Probably Abrellis. I like the fact they threw him out a fucking window. Uh, Carmine Galante, because he just gets fucking eaten alive. Uh, but really, my favorite one was the attempted hit on John Stampha. I mean, uh, fucking rush hour traffic. It was brazen. It was ballsy. And they were absolutely fucking determined to kill that prick. Uh, that is one of my favorites, believe it or not. Look at it as a, a highway drive-by. You know, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, but that's my favorite. It's, it's a shame that, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I mean, in some ways, it's like... Christ, you're you're three feet from the car. You didn't kill the guy. You failed, but they lit the fucking car up. That's for sure, and and that's the way it should be done. All right, why can't mobsters who seem to want to and always talk about it successfully go legit? Have any real gangsters pulled it off entirely, pulled their lives and their families and uh, out of the mob and survive? Um, I'm sure there have been. Uh, if you listen to Michael Francis's bullshit. Uh, of course he has, uh, but you know, he's on a whole nother level of piece of shit that I don't want to go into. Uh, but there have been guys that left the life and, and, and realistically made a life for themselves. But listen, let me tell you something. Anybody that tells you they were in a mob and they're not a rat and they've just left the life, they're still involved in crime. I have never met one fucking guy that has said he's retired from the mob that isn't fucking making money illegally. The lure of, first of all, how can you take a motherfucker whose his whole life has been nickel and dime and everybody's stealing what isn't locked the fuck down, and all of a sudden they decide, oh, I'm going to sell fucking real estate. You mean they're going to go legit. They've spent their whole lives making millions of dollars, breaking the law, and all of a sudden they want to do it legitimately and pay taxes on it? Fuck out of here. Come on, it doesn't exist. I've never met a guy that's totally legit. I know guys that are gangsters that are semi-legit, they have legit fucking companies, construction companies, this re- rehab housing, 
uh, fucking lighting fixtures, whatever the case may be. But listen, when money is too easily made to get it illegally, you're not going to go legit. You may do some legit shit on paper to hide your money, but the reality is you're not going to stop. You're always going to loan shark. You're always going to book make. You're always going to try to fuck the next guy and nickel and dime them. That's reality. So anybody that tells you they're completely legit is completely full of shit. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Does Sonny Francis still has a contract? Does Sonny Francis still have a contract out on John Gotti Jr.? Uh, if not, does the Colombo crime family still have a contract out on him? Uh, these guys rack because they have no consequences for snitching. I would agree. That's why people snitch because they don't want to fucking go to jail. That's the reality of that. Uh, as far as there still being a contract out on John Gotti Jr., I would suspect there isn't. I know there was uh, from not only the Gambino crime family, but also. Uh, on behalf of Sonny Francis. Francis never liked Gotti, never liked the son. That's public knowledge. Uh, that beef may go back to a lot of different things. I, I think that a lot of people uh, did not think that John Gotti Jr. deserved the title of boss. I don't think that they think that he deserved to be where he was. I think a lot of people think that he was handed that position because John Sr. wanted to keep control over the family. And I would probably agree with that. Uh, I know that from some people that, that I have spoken to, uh, the people have alleged that the junior ripped people off. I, I really honestly cannot tell you for a fact if he did or he didn't, but that seems to be uh, a part of the reason why people don't like him. But like I said, I, I'm not involved in that kind of stuff, so I don't know. So a lot of it just may be because they don't like John Gotti Jr. and they're willing to say whatever. Uh, but I think there's enough people that are saying sort of the same thing or at least uh, giving the same reasons uh, for wanting him dead or wanted him dead or for why they didn't like him. Uh, you'd have to ask them. But what I can tell you is what I heard and, and what I have heard, and it's not a fucking lie and it's not my opinion. What I have been told was people didn't like him because he had an ego. They felt he was a punk. They felt that he got his position through his father. He didn't earn it. Uh, but like I said, I don't know. I wasn't there. This is what people uh, who would know that told me uh, I think that they felt like he thought he could boss other crime families around he felt like he was the strongest boss there was and and that's not really the truth because if Vincent the Chinjagante wanted John Gotti Jr. dead he would have been fucking dead that's the truth uh, that that's the absolute truth and, and there were a lot of guys in the Gambino crime family uh, that didn't like John Gotti Jr. Uh, at all whatsoever um, and and there's a lot of stuff along the line about that. But like I said, I don't want to put words in anybody's fucking mouth. But from my knowledge, from the people that I did talk to, he's not respected in any circle for any reason. Uh, a lot of people do not like him and didn't like him. Uh, but like I said, there's that's just one side of the story. There's always three or four or five or six sides to the story. Uh, but that's what I've been told. What their reasons are, you know, they have their reasons. Uh, but... They probably didn't say those things when he was boss. And I'll at least give him that. Is it nobody nobody said that to him when he was boss? And a lot of people were saying it after the fact. But from everything that I've heard, uh, people just didn't like him, didn't respect him. They didn't think he was tough. Uh, and they seemed to think that if it wasn't for his father, this guy never would have become a captain. Uh, and, and that's their opinion, and they're entitled to that. It's not my opinion. That's their opinion. All right. Our families today going back to the basics to earn say, fixing sporting games, uh, numbers racket, or do they need to get more complex with online scams, et cetera, et cetera. Listen, it, they're always going to fix, uh, they're, they're always going to try to fix horse races. They're always going to gamble. They're always going to loan shark. They're always going to sell drugs. They're always going to shake people down. They're going to run protection. They're going to do online scams like porn companies, phone cards. Well, not phone cards. That's like fucking circa 1990. Uh, pump and dump fraud schemes, stock schemes. They're never going to change what the core rackets are. The, those are never going to change. They're always going to remain the same. They're just getting a little more sophisticated in some of the things they do. I mean, I think we're seeing now with HUD homes and home rehabbing, uh, and I'm not going to get too specific here, but I happen to know of, and this is not uh, this is not in Philadelphia. This is in other, another state more north of New York. Uh, there's a lot of HUD home ripoffs that are going on. There's a lot of fake rehabs that are going on, a lot of insurance fraud stuff, a lot of arson jobs. There's stuff going on uh, where people will buy HUD homes and they'll set it ablaze and collect the assurance. I know that that's going on. So really in its whole, 
I don't think that they're doing anything more sophisticated than they did in the old days. It's still the same stuff. But the, the idea of walking into your corner bodega and saying, listen, you're going to pay me $200 a fucking week or else I'm going to torch this fucking place, you motherfucker. Those days are over. Those days are over. Uh, there is protection rackets. There are shakedowns still going on. I mean, even recently the other day, we see the Gambinos are tied to a big fucking construction racket that was going on, I believe, in Westchester or the Bronx. So they're never going to change the style. Construction, especially carpenters unions, those are never going to change. But unions are your money maker. You control the unions. You control the flow. You control the workers. You control the product. You control everything. Uh, and, and so those things are never going to change on their face. But they will do stuff like computer far fraud, uh, credit card fraud, you know, stuff like that is always, always, always going to happen. All right, so all that being said, those are the only questions that I am going to take today because we're reaching the hour mark, and I still got to do Stefano Magadino. Uh, in the meantime, we are going to take a short break, and when we come back, we are going to get to Stefano Magadino. Uh, however, I wanted to say a couple of things really quick. You can follow us on Facebook, type in Mob Talk Radio, give us a like, subscribe. If you hate us, you hate us. I don't give a fuck what you think. That's just the reality of it. I, I don't get bent about uh, people having to say what they want. Now, a lot of people are saying, how do I submit questions? Very easy. Go to Mob Talk Radio and hit message and just Message me your question, and I will get to you as quick as I can. I know there's a lot of other people uh, who are submitting questions nonstop. Unfortunately, I just cannot get to every single one of them, but I put them in the list, and I pull from them every week. So if I don't get to it today, I will get to it. I promise you. Uh, all that being said, we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to talk about Stefano Magadino. <laughs> Welcome back to Mob Talk Radio, and we are going to be talking about uh, the life of Stefano Magadino. Uh, if you're unsure of who he was, he was the longest tenured boss ever with over 50 years as boss of the Buffalo crime family. Uh, Stefano Magadino was born in 1891 in Castamolare del Golfo, Sicily. Uh, he was the third of eight children to Giovanni and Giuseppe Magadino. Uh, when Stefano was born... Uh, his family was at war uh, with the Bussolato crime family. Uh, there would be several murders that would take place on both sides of that. Stefano would lose some brothers um, and cousins, uh, and that's something that he would never forget, and he would take his revenge years later. Uh, Stefano eventually would leave Sicily for Williamsburg, Brooklyn in the mid-1900s. When he arrived in Brooklyn, he would go to work in the streets and would begin his ascent into uh, the strong allied Castamolare clan. In 1921, he would avenge the death of his brother by killing uh, Camillo Giazzo, who he believed whacked his brother on the orders of Frank uh, Bus Busolato. Uh, his brother Pietro was killed, and obviously uh, Magadino would take his revenge. Uh, Giazzo would be shot and strangled and left in a burlap bag in Avon, New Jersey. Shortly after, Magadino would flee from Buffalo, New York in an attempt to avoid being arrested. Uh, at the time of his murder, Joe Bonanno was the de facto leader of the Castamolare clan, but would return to Italy for reasons somewhat unknown. Uh, but Niccolo Shiro would end up taking over the Castamolare clan. Shiro would import 
Salvatore Maranzano from Sicily, and Maranzano would take the Shiro crime family to new heights as he handled the bootlegging operations for Shiro. Uh, Maranzano also uh, had an in with the government to get fraudulent papers so that they could smuggle Italians into the country, uh, making them legal citizens. Uh, so that was one of the things that uh, Maranzano was able to do. Uh, on August 16th of 1921, Stefano Magadino would be arrested and others for the murder of Chiazzo. Uh, five would be arrested, including Magadino, Vito, Bonave- uh, excuse me, Vito Bonaventure, uh, Bartolo de Gregorio, and Bartolo Fontana, and also as well Francesco Puma, and one other person whose name I obviously don't have. Uh, probably the first case of a rat uh, in the wings, uh, Bartolo Fontana pretty much ends up giving up his role in the murder. He admits to taking place in the murder, and he admits those that were involved. He also gives up uh, the facts surrounding the Shiro crime family uh, and why the hit was actually done. Uh, And he also gave them as well... uh, all the names of the people that were involved. Also at the time, there was a war that were go- that was going on between rival gangsters with a huge string of murders. Uh, Fontana explained the reason for the hit in New Jersey and then ends up giving investigators the lowdown on the beef between the Morello crime family and the upstart uh, Salvatore Luacano and his war with the Morellos and more specifically that of Salvatore Di Aquila. Uh, Fontana would end up testifying in his testimony actually didn't back up the evidence that was submitted. Uh, and it also doesn't help that Stefano Magadino uh, pretty much has Francesco Puma killed while waiting for his trial in an effort to silence those that were talking. As a result, the charges would end up getting tossed and Magadino would end up going back to Buffalo. Uh, Magadino would then end up going to work for Joe DiCarlo. Uh, Joe DiCarlo at the time was running the Buffalo crime family. DiCarlo, by all accounts, was a tough guy, uh, and doesn't had did not hesitate to use murder as a means to an end. DiCarlo established a hit squad called the Good Killers. The Good Killers mainly did hits for other crime families, including including their own, sort of like Murder Inc., but a little bit, uh, I think, just prior to Murder Inc., or maybe just after. I'm not sure on the date on that. Uh, they ended up killing guys in Pittsburgh, Detroit, New York, and Ohio. Uh, the group was from uh, the entire group was from Sicily, all the same area, Castamolari del Golfo. Uh, and Magadino and DiCarlo would end up becoming very close friends, and Magadino, in fact, would end up expanding the rackets to the docks and on the waterfront. Uh, in 1922, DiCarlo would die of a heart attack, and Magadino, with his expertise in his violent side, would end up being unchallenged and would end up taking over the Buffalo crime family. All right, so in 1930, the Castamare War begins, uh, and it really begins over a shipment of booze that was stolen from Joe Masseria, and Joe Masseria was pissed. Joe Masseria believed that everything belonged to him, uh, but in truth, most of the operations in the United States were actually controlled by him at the time. So on the Masseria side of things, you had Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, uh, Alfred Mineo, Willie Moretti, Joe Adonis, and Frank Costello. Uh, and so back in Sicily, Don Ca- Cascio Ferro uh, sort of hears what's going on, and he sort of thinks that he should kind of own everything, and therefore he ends up sending Salvatore Maranzano to New York to take over all the rackets, at least so he suspects can happen. Uh, over on the Maranzano side of things, you had Joe Bonanno, Joe Provacci, Joe Aiello, and Stefano Magadino. Both sides really, at the end of the day, just want to complete control of the entire rack to the United States. So it was a vie for power as far as which group was going to control all of organized crime in the United States. Uh, as war erupts, dozens get killed on both sides. But secretly behind the scenes, Lucky Luciano pretty much is fed up with the whole thing. Uh, and he ends up holding a secret meeting to discuss the events and how... The mayhem and everything is going to cripple all the rackets. His belief was we should all just be making money instead of fighting each other. There's more than enough to go around. Ultimately, both Masseria and Maranzano would have to die, and that's pretty much exactly what happened. And we have talked about the Castamolari Wars before on this show, and if you go in and you type in Castamolari Wars on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Um, And if not, you can look it up for yourself. Um, But so eventually Lucky Luciano ends up 
taking over, okay? Uh, and he ends up forming the commission, which was loosely based at the time, but Luciano changed sort of the derivative of how that operated. Uh, and Magadino obviously gets a seat on the commission. And for those that don't know, Magadino and Joe Bonanno were related. Uh, Bonanno was Magadino's nephew, but yet they called each other cousins on the streets. Uh, Magadino would have a firm grip on bootlegging, bringing in illegal booze from Canada into the United States. Under the terms of the commission, he was entitled to most of Canada except Montreal, which he conceded, and he gave that to Joe Bonanno. Uh, Magadino had a lock on a shitload of fucking territory, and Joe Bonanno comes to him and and really wants to, to have a part of Canada, and because they're related, Magadino relents and lets him have Montreal. Uh, as prohibition ends, Magadino ends, ends up beginning to stretch his rackets into loan sharking, gambling, prostitution, narcotics, extortion, carjacking, and would end up controlling pretty much all the local unions in the area. Uh, with the funds from those rackets, he would then begin to open up legitimate businesses, including a funeral home, a linen service, uh, which supported all the local hotels within a 300-mile radius of Buffalo, and he would also form a cab company, which served greater Buffalo. So like Russell Buffalino, who actually came up underneath Magadino, uh, Russell Buffalino was on record as saying that it was Magadino who truly taught him how to run rackets and taught him how to take illegal money and to filter it into the legitimate businesses. Um, and so, like we said, Magadino's territory was immense. Uh, prior to the deal with Bonanno, Magadino likely had the most territory out of any boss we've ever discussed on the show before. He had Buffalo, Utica, Canada, Toronto, Rochester, Youngtown, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, Amsterdam, New York, and he had all of eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, Magadino is also the longest tenured boss to ever have lived, controlling his family for 52 years. Nobody else has ever done that. Uh, but because Magadino's territory was so vast and out of the way, that's exactly why he didn't fall into the same sort of trappings that other bosses had, albeit you know, internal squabbles over turf and money and et cetera. He was way out in the middle of fucking nowhere. And therefore, because he wasn't in the city, he didn't have to deal with guys nickel and dime in each other over construction rackets. He pretty much just did his own thing. Um, he was often counted on within the commission and with other crime families to sort of be the voice of reason and could be called on uh, to sort of handle disputes between families. Uh, his stature within the commission and the mafia itself was so powerful that he was not only on the commission, but was also in attendance for some of the biggest mob summits that ever happened, including the infamous 1946 Havana Summit and the 1957 Appalachian meeting. It's also worth noting, too, that uh, a lot of people have blamed a lot of different people for the Appalachian meeting. It was Stefano Magadino who called the meeting because Vito Genovese asked for it. Uh, Magadino took a lot of shit and lost a lot of respect and credibility because of that, because the mob wanted to blame somebody for those actions. But Vito Genovese is the one that wanted to call the meeting because he wanted to be recognized as the boss, and he wanted Carlo Gambino to be recognized as boss of the Gambino crime family. And there were drugs and other things that they needed to discuss, but... Uh, Genovese did not have the power to call that meeting. Magadino did, and Magadino therefore went ahead and did it, and he was blamed just like Genovese was for a long time for what happened at that meeting. So in 1944, Magadino sees an opportunity to sort of take out the Canadian middleman. Uh, they were dealing with gangsters in Canada as well, and what Magadino saw is an opportunity. If we can take out the middleman, then we can really control the supply and we can make a lot more money than we, we are currently. And that's exactly what he does. He ends up killing Rocco Perry, uh, who was pretty much the Canadian middleman uh, in the booze control. And he actually, and these are going to be some names I want you to remember. Uh, he used Canadian hit guys for the job, Johnny Papalia and Antonio Papalia. And the reason why that's 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 important is because the papayas would end up becoming a crime family um so it wasn't just uh, johnny and antonio papaya but it was also giacomo lupino and if you look further into canadian organized crime there's a lupino crime family and the papaya crime family so they really got a lot of strength from attaching themselves to magadino at the time and he used them to take out uh, rocco perry who who essentially was a bootlegger in Canada and a gangster. Um, all right, so we we have that. Uh, so while Magadino was, uh, Magadino always supported Joe Bonanno in the beginning. Uh, but at the same time, he also knew that, that Joe Bonanno 
by nature was petty and was jealous and and yearned for more. Uh, But it was really the move that Bonanno made in 1963 that really changes Stefano Magadino's sort of viewpoint on his nephew, Joe Bonanno. And basically, uh, Bonanno felt that he was outvoted, outplayed at every turn, and that he felt that he deserved to be boss of bosses and that he decided in a grand scheme of things that he would take out the commission. If he takes out the commission, he could overtake the mob and there's nothing anybody can do. Uh, those on the commission at the time pretty much uh, would have been Tommy Lucchese, Stefano Magadino, Carlo Gambino, and Frank De Simone. Uh, Bonanno essentially realizes he needs to have strength to do this. And so what he does, he goes to see Joe Magliacco and Magliacco at the time had taken over the Profaci crime family. Uh, and we know the tie between Bonanno and Profaci as Joe Bonanno's son, Bill or Salvatore, uh, married Rosalie Profaci. So that bond was by marriage and that made them strong. And therefore, he used that friendship and that relationship to go to Joe Magliacco to try to talk him into this. Um, so the issue with the Profacis was that Gambino and Lucchese's and the basically Carlo Gambino and, and Tommy Lucchese and others felt that Joe Provacci pretty much had been controlled by Bonanno for a long time. And there were a lot of issues with Profacci. His men didn't like him. They didn't like the way that Profacci handled the kidnapping issue. They didn't like the way that he treated Joey Gallo when he came out of prison uh, or, and they, they didn't even like the way that uh, Joe Colombo handled the, the Joey Gallo situation, which would lead to his murder down the road. Uh, but, the mob uh, hierarchy realized that Bonanno and Profaci had shown a willingness to be unloyal to the commission and do things behind their back. Therefore, the commission pretty much had banned Joe Profaci and specifically Joe Magliacco from having a commission seat. And this is something that really pissed off Joe Magliacco. He felt he deserved a seat. He felt that he was different than Joe Profaci and he should have an opportunity to speak his piece and, and sort of be a part of the, the commission. Uh, but this is essentially why Magliacco decides with Joe Bonanno, let's go ahead and hit the commission. And so what Magliacco does is he is given the job to set up Lucchese and Gambino to get them taken out of the way. And what he does is he goes to his hitman uh, and Joe Colombo. Joe Colombo at the time was a hitman for the Profaci crime family. The problem was is that Joe Colombo was pretty much kind of a snake in the grass and he recognized an opportunity for himself. And the opportunity was if I go along with this and it doesn't work, I'm going to get fucking killed. Everybody's going to get fucking killed. But if I go to Carlo Gambino and I go to Tommy Lucchese and I tell them what's going to happen, maybe I can use this down the road to get myself elevated. And that's essentially what ended up happening. He goes to Gambino Lucchese, explains the plot against them. uh, And pretty much what happens as a result of that is the commission gets pissed. Uh, And what ends up happening from there is that Gambino and Magadino Lucchese and Tommy D, uh, Tommy D. Simone, fuck, Frank D. Simone, they sit down and they discuss the plot and, and basically what's going on. And they all kind of come away with a consensus that, that Magliacco uh, couldn't have been by himself on this plot. Magliacco did not have the fucking power to do it. He didn't have the manpower, and they didn't think he had the willpower to do it. So they realized that somebody else was really uh, sort of in control of this idea and that Magliacco just went along with it because he was pissed. And what they sort of start to figure out is they realize that Magliacco is obviously upset that he didn't have a commission seat. Uh, they're upset that he doesn't feel that, that he feels like, you know, he's not getting the respect he deserves. Uh, and so at the end of the day, they sort of put it together and they, they start to believe that Joe Bonanno was the one who was really the guy that was putting the plot in action. Um, and they also sort of begin to realize that they think that Joe Bonanno likely, if he has them killed, that he would likely try to take over the whole entire mafia, maybe try to merge the five families together, and then ultimately he would have had Joe Magliacco killed as well. So don't think for one second that that Joe Magliacco believed or thought that Joe Bonanno was really going to take his back and elevate him as well. I think Joe Bonanno had desires to take over the whole entire mafia, to be boss of bosses, uh, and that's pretty much 
the way that that went. So what they end up doing is they summon Joe Bonanno and Joe Magliacco to a commission meeting. Magliacco ends up showing up. He admits his role in the plot uh, and pretty much just tells them it was Joe Bonanno that was behind it, but he was in on it as well. And because he was honest, he was allowed to live. If, if he had lied, they would have killed him on the spot. Uh, he ends up giving getting a stiff fine, and he gets shelled from the mob. He's out. He's done. They let him live. Joe Bonanno, on the other hand, like a pussy, runs to Canada and never shows up. Uh, eventually, he would be expelled from Canada for not being a citizen, and they would take. And then he would fake his own kidnapping uh, because he was afraid that the commission was going to kill him. Uh, and so the commission has a problem now. They have to deal with Joe Bonanno, and what the commission decides is that. Bonanno wouldn't be killed for his actions, but his days as boss were over, uh, and the Bonanos are going to lose their commission seat. They're done. We don't trust them. He's fucked up. It's over with. So Bonanno was essentially allowed to leave New York, told not to come back, uh, and was supposed to stay out of criminal activity on any level, uh, which Bonanno ultimately would not listen to. Uh, and it's my gut feeling that if Carlo Gambino had still been alive, uh, when Bonanno started his bullshit out in Arizona and Los Angeles, I think they probably would have killed Joe Bonanno. Uh, and as for Joe Bonanno's bullshit kidnapping, he ended up telling the government and a bunch of other people that it was that it was his uncle, that, that Stefano Magadino had essentially kidnapped him, and, and it was all a bunch of bullshit, which infuriated Magadino, infuriated him. Uh, and that pretty much essentially ended their relationship, even if there was anything left, uh, after the commit attempt to, to hit the commission. Uh, so, uh, in 1968, uh, which is widely, uh, and, and, and this is going to be subjugation. There's no proof to back it up, but, but a, what a lot of people seem to think is that there's an incident that happens in 1968, and the government and law enforcement is sort of tipped off that there's over $600,000 stashed in the attic the attic of Stefano Magadino and his son's home. Uh, it's long been purported that it's Joe Bonanno who was angry and dropped a dime and told them that he had this kind of money. Uh, whether or not that's true or not, we'll never really know, but it would sort of make sense sort of on another level. Uh, and it's also been inserted, asserted that all that money was from bookmaking proceeds, but that creates a big problem for Magadino. And the reason why it creates a problem is now he's got law enforcement. He just lost his money. Uh, but he had been telling the men underneath of him who were expecting raises or more money or a lesser kick up to them that money was really tight. And in fact, that was a lie. And the fact that authorities found that kind of money infuriated his own men and it sort of became a resentment for them. And we've seen this before, specifically with Joe Profaci. He did the same thing. Uh, you know, he would claim he didn't have money and he would take all this extra money for guys. He wouldn't let them earn. Joe Bonanno similarly had the same issue. Uh, he would just disappear to Arizona and not control his men and sort of leave them on their own. And there's guys killing guys and they're like, you know, here we are killing guys in the fucking streets and the boss is in Arizona getting a fucking suntan. What the fuck is with this? Uh, so we've seen this kind of stuff before and it ended up causing a big resentment uh, with those that were in within, <coughs> excuse me, the Buffalo crime family. Uh, and what happens as a reaction to that is there's a split uh, in the Buffalo crime family. Um, it would eventually, you know, like I said, cause a split. It would splinter into two factions. Uh, and eventually high-end capos would have a meeting in Rochester, New York, and they pretty much ousted Magadino as the boss in 1960. Nine late late sixty eight early sixty nine. Why Magadino? While Magadino would st would still have some sort of authority, he was not uh, effectively uh, the boss in charge anymore. Um, he still had old world in laws, cousins, and relatives that were by his side, but his power was really never the same after nineteen sixty nine. Uh, Magadino would end up dying in nineteen seventy four. And a war ends up breaking out for control of the family and ultimately would end in the 1980s as Joe Todaro would end up taking over the crime family. Now, what makes Joe Magadino so particularly special in this case that we're talking about is that he lived during a time where there was a lot of politics, 
Uh, and I don't think people realize how much power he truly had. It was, like I said earlier, Russell Buffalino came up underneath of him uh, and learned a lot of the things that he needed to learn underneath his tutorship, if we can say that. Uh, I think the one thing that we could say that Magadino fucked up on, uh, even if he was the boss, sort of in name and title now, and when I said for 52 years, yes, in name. But I think the longevity of him actually telling people what to do is not 52 years. I, I think that's a safe assumption. Uh, but Magadino sort of did, a, like I said earlier, what Joe Profaci did. You know, he pinched the quarter till the Eagles screamed. He didn't let guys earn as much as they could. He claimed he didn't have a, a lot of money, but yet he controlled parts of Ohio and, and eastern Pennsylvania and all of these other places and had legitimate businesses and legitimate companies and was making hand over fist. And that's a problem that we've seen, like I said, three fucking times already, that historically we see this with the problem. When you have a boss, Angelo Bruno, let's let's bring up a Philadelphia boss for a minute. Angelo, one of the problems that Angelo Bruno had was he did not like to use violence as an ends to the means. He liked to, to sort of talk it out. He liked to, to make agreements with people, no reason to kill anybody. But when you tell your own guys that they cannot sell drugs and then you allow other crews from other crime families to come in and actually sell drugs, it's sort of a, a slap in the face. You mean to tell me that the Gam Cherry Hill Gambinos can sell fucking coke, but we can't, but yet you're taking proceeds off of it, you're getting fucking rich, and we're not making any fucking money. So historically, we always say that history repeats itself, and it did in the case of Angelo Bruno, uh, it did in the case of Joe Profaci, and it did in the case of Joe Bonanno. Now, granted, each one of those cases is a little bit different, but it's the same sort of theory, uh, is that uh, to, to, to bring it into more relevant terms, uh, Carlo Gambino said no drugs can be sold, yet he knew that the Gambino, the Rosario Gambino and those guys were in Jersey selling drugs. He was taking profits. Paul Castellano said the same fucking thing. He was taking profits. Then John Gotti, his crew was selling heroin. Jeannie Gotti and, and allegedly and uh, Angelo Rogerio were all selling drugs. Gotti had to have known they were selling drugs. And he was definitely taking a kickback from it. And one of the reasons why they didn't want to know was they don't want to know where the fucking money comes from because drugs is a serious fucking pinch. Guys were getting 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in prison for this kind of nonsense. So if they don't know where the money's coming from, excuse me, if they don't know where the money's coming from, it's all good, but they don't want to know. So when you take a situation where it was, was Carlo Gambino a hypocrite? Sure. Was Joe Bonanno a hypocrite? Yeah, because Joe Bonanno lied and said he never sold drugs. And he was, what do you think Montreal was? Montreal was a way station for, from Corsica and fucking France for the drugs to come in through Afghanistan and Sicily. So the idea that Joe Colombo or Joe Bonanno never sold drugs is bullshit. He did sell drugs, okay? So when Paul Castellano says, nobody can sell drugs, you know, the edict since 1970 was you're not allowed to sell drugs, Paul had no problem accepting drug proceeds. He just did not want to get caught up in a drug conspiracy. And so when Angelo Ruggiero and Jeannie Gotti get caught selling drugs and he finds out that Gotti knows about it, well, now there needs to be some fucking retribution for it because there's no way that Gotti could not have known that his crew was selling drugs because Gotti was obviously taking a kick up from it. So Paul Castellano needed somebody to blame because he got tied into it uh, because Angelo Ruggiero was caught on wiretaps talking about the shit in his kitchen. Uh, so the, we, we always talk in this show about, you know, the mob doesn't sell drugs. They do. Okay. That's, that's reality. Uh, they do sell drugs. Uh, they will take proceeds from drugs, but sort of the tongue in cheek is, is that they don't want to be directly tied to it. They don't want to directly be involved. They don't want to get indicted, but, but it's not going to stop them from taking proceeds. Uh, drugs is one of the biggest money makers for the mob. I, maybe not these days. Uh, but back in the, the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s and 80s, it was. Maybe even early 90s. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are guys still selling drugs today. Uh, but the pinch is too severe. Uh, especially when you look at like prescription drugs and, and stuff like that. The pinch is way too fucking severe. Uh, but it just shows the hypocrisy uh, in, in many kind of ways. I, I think that every mob boss in the history of the mob has been involved in taking drug proceeds. Uh, but do I think that that's... Uh, the way it is today no probably not there's too many other rackets they can get involved in uh but the quickest way to make uh, millions of dollars is to sell drugs 
So, you know, did did Magadino get into the drug business? Of course he did. Of course he did. When he controlled all of Canada, uh, once bootlegging and, and prohibition ends, how do you think he's making his money? Uh, a bulk of it's coming from loan shark and extortion, gambling, racketeering, prostitution, carjacking, uh, bars, nightclubs, and all of that. But drugs is still the way station. And don't forget that Appalachian meeting was all about drugs. It was all about drugs. Genovese had Galante working for him at the time. Galante wanted to be the boss. He had all the connections. Luciano had put together the, the drug route with, along with Galante. Luciano also uh, had the contacts in Sicily to move it. So the idea that, and that you can go to the 80s, the pizza, con- uh, the pizza connection. And all of that stuff and, and the, the heroin that was being shipped from Afghanistan and Sicily and moving through pizzerias all throughout the United States from Maine to Florida uh, and even into the Midwest. Uh, so where there's a will, there's a way. And guys are always going to fucking make money. But I think in terms of Magadino, because I got a little off topic here, uh, Magadino was a guy who came along that was a good boss for a long time. But the trappings of greed destroyed him from within and from the outside from within and when guys get too fucking greedy this is what happens and i'll use a better reference for this john Gotti and sammy to pull gravano gravano has got his hands in every fucking racket in the city he's controlling all of the fucking construction in manhattan all of it all of it not one thing not two things fucking all of it he had his hands in everything He's making the Gambino crime family at the time. I believe it was said they were making four hundred fifty million dollars a year. How much is a fuck enough? You figure. You figure Gravano probably, uh, and these numbers will not be accurate, so don't hold me to it. But but you got to figure Gravano is probably bringing twenty thirty million dollars a year by himself. That's not accounting for every other fucking racket. That's not accounting for what Mikey Scars was doing, what some of these other guys were doing, what, what Joe Watts was bringing in. All of these other guys were making a ton of fucking money. And yet Gotti is caught on fucking wiretaps bitching about Sammy Gravano making fucking money. Well, what the fuck is the point of the mafia? I mean, do you join the mafia just because you want to fucking kill people? Maybe that's why Mickey Featherstone did. You think that's why Jimmy Burke got involved? No, it's fucking money. Nobody joins the mob just because they're like, hey, I want to kill a bunch of pricks. It's about money. It's about power, right? So Sammy Gravano does what he's supposed to do. He kills people, has people killed, earns his family a lot of fucking money, which was his fucking job. And here you are, got Gotti on fucking wiretaps, complaining that Sammy's making too much money. Gotti's not complaining about the $100,000 a week. He's fucking pissing away and gambling and losing. He would bet on two cockroaches fucking racing up a fucking wall and would lose. He's bitching about fucking money. It's not because, oh, Sammy's, you know, stretching his arms too much. It's going to bring heat on the crime family. That wasn't his concern. His concern was petty fucking jealousy. He was afraid that Sammy the Bull Gravano would make so much fucking money and gain so much power and notoriety that Sammy could eventually turn around and take Gotti the fuck out. And that's what Gotti's fear was. It wasn't fear that Sammy was making too much. It wasn't fear that Sammy, you know, was, you know, stretching it thin. He was afraid Sammy the Bull was going to take over his fucking job. That's the reality of it. So he gets caught on these tapes whining, complaining, uh, Sammy this, Sammy that. Uh. And then he indicts half the fucking Gambino crime family. And what does that lead to? It leads to Sammy the Bull fucking ratting on him, and we know how historically that ended. And so that's the thing. The root of all this is greed. The minute that you get too greedy and you want, want, want is when you start to have problems. You look at Ray Patriarca. He didn't have those problems. He wasn't greedy. He took his monies and his family just kept going. He ran his family for 30 fucking five years or 40 years, whatever the fuck the thing was. Never had a problem. There's been other bosses that have been able to do that. You know? And that's the thing. When, when, you, when your head begins to get bigger than the bottom line, that's when you have problems. Do I think that Angelo Bruno would have been fucking hit? If he had allowed them guys to sell drugs, do you think Bruno gets hit? No. Maybe not then. He probably still would have been hit. But not then. Because guys would have been able to earn and make a little more money. And that would have kept them happy. 
It's an old saying. I, I, Machiavelli, has, and I'm going to paraphrase it best because I'm a big fan of Machiavelli, the, the Prince. If you've never read The, read the Prince by uh, Nicola Machiavelli, you probably should because that's where the mafia gets its fucking structure. That's where the mafia gets its rules. That's where the mafia gets its business acumen. Is that you never give the men underneath you too much. If you give them too much, they don't respect you and it's easy to overthrow you. You give them just enough to survive, maybe a little bit so that they want a little more. If you do that, they're happy and they have no reason to take you off your throne. You give them everything, they don't need you, they'll take you out. But if you give them just enough to survive, enough to make them content, then you have a nice little happy crime family. And that's the reality of it. These bosses... That get greedy. Magadino in the end got greedy. Joe Bonanno was greedy. Uh, Angelo Bruno, I wouldn't say he was necessarily greedy, but he would let other crime families earn money instead of his own, and that that's not going to sit well on the fucking streets. And so I'll give you a narrative before I close out. Take take a take a take a organized crime boss. All right, put him at the top. All the money's going to flow up from the captains, from the soldiers, associates, whatever the fuck the case may be. Imagine if you have a boss that's taken 40% from his captains. Then the captain's got to take an additional fucking 25% from the guys below them just to make ends meet. And usually it's around 10 to 12% and guys hide money and they lie about what they make. That's just, that's the reality of it. But when you have somebody that, first of all, if a crime family is making $400 million a year, the fuck does a boss need four hundred million dollars for? He doesn't. You would think a motherfucker would be happy with twenty million. And that's the thing. It's the greed. It's the greed. And you look at these old world bosses. They would have a fucking war chest. They would say, "All right, we're pulling in. Four, we'll use an example: forty million dollars this year." We're going to take three of that. That's going to lawyers in case anybody gets arrested. We're going to take three of this, and we're going to use that for the guy's family if he ends up in jail. You think John Gotti did that? I guarantee you he didn't. That's the way that it was in the old days. They took care of guys when they went to prison. Now, fuck, the minute you go to jail, they're taking everything you fucking own. You're on your own. The core values have gone. There is a crime family that I still believe today, honest to God, sitting here right now, that I think still does shit like that, and they will look out for you if you end up in the can. They don't just forget about you and shove you off and say, yeah, go fuck yourself. You're on your own. You got caught. You're a fucking dunce. We don't need you. But the majority of them don't think that way. And so when you start to lose those core values from the old days and guys aren't taking care of guys' families, what do you, I, I think Mikey scores. Listen, the guy's a fucking rat, but he had a point when he said, look, for 30 fucking years or whatever the fuck case may be. I made you guys a lot of money. I did this, this, that, and the third. You whacked my fucking brother. I left that fucking alone. I didn't come after you for that. I'm sitting in the can. I need money dispersed to my wife, to my kids, and you tell me go fuck myself. I'm not, I'm just going to take all your money and you're fucking nothing now that you're locked up. You have put that guy in a position because whatever ambivalence that he might have fucking had with, with Sammy or fucking John Gotti Jr. or whoever the fuck the case may have been at the time. Whoever he had beefs with, that's now amplified because now you just fucked him out of a lot of money. Money that he rightfully fucking made for you. And it's deserved to him. Like when Sammy DeBull Gravano went to jail. What do they do? They immediately, on orders of John Gotti Jr., they run in and take all his Shylock and bookmaking money that was left over on the streets. Now, I'm not saying that should have gone to Sammy Gravano because fuck him. He's a rat. He's done. But Mikey Scars, before he even fucking flipped the fucking dime on anybody they took his fucking money they took everything and refused to give it to him so now he's got to fight his legal battles with his own with whatever he's got laying around but it doesn't account for everything else he fucking made the construction rack rackets the the marble company the stone company he had that they took from him what do you expect that's not honor that's not fucking loyalty loyalty isn't fucking a guy out of what he owns because you're a greedy fucking prick. And I guarantee you one thing. And maybe I'm wrong. But if they hadn't have fucked Mikey Scars the way they did financially, maybe he doesn't rat. Maybe he takes a fucking 40-year pinch and never says a fucking word. But the minute he goes in, boom, he starts calling home. Hey, I need my money for this, that, the lawyer, this. 
Tell him to go fuck himself. What do you want a guy to do at that point? Oh, okay. Go fuck myself. All right, so I'm going to sit and I'm not justifying ratting on any stretch of the fucking imagination. I am not saying that that's right. But I kill people, I do my thing for this crime family, and I've brought in millions of dollars, X, Y, and Z, and I ask you for a portion of my proceeds to defend myself or to fucking help my family out when I know I'm going away for the rest of my fucking life. You tell me to go fuck myself? I don't got nothing? Well, who knows what you're going to do at that point? Because he obviously isn't going to get out, because I think if he did, he would have killed a lot of people. He wouldn't have had no choice to take what's his. But it all comes back to greed. Greed is the worst thing that ever happened to the mob. And, and and there's there's and I want to say this very loosely. I know a lot of different people of all walks of life. I know guys that are street guys, guys that are fringe guys, guys that are made guys, captains, whatever the fuck. I know a lot of different people in a lot of different positions and that sort of lifestyle. I know drug dealers. I know I know a lot of different people. The one thing that I can say with a couple of people that I may or may not know is they're not fucking greedy. They stay under the radar. They make whatever they need to feel comfortable and they keep it moving. They're not going to argue over nickel and dime, $5, $10 here and there. You, you have a deal where they get fucked out of 80, 90 grand. That might change a narrative, might change their behavior a little bit. But if you're not out the fuck over the next guy, and everybody's making money down the line, then there is no problem. You're always going to have a guy that's going to rack because he doesn't want to do jail time. That, that's reality. But this thing was never meant to be based on greed. Make your fucking money. Be happy. Has anybody ever met a captain that didn't have a fucking $800,000, $900,000 house? I haven't. I'm not saying all lived that way. But if you're making legit, if you're making money, well, what's to get greedy about? The fuckers that are greedy, look at how they end. Gotti, boom, dies in prison. Angelo Bruno gets fucking whacked. Joe Bonanno gets fucking chased. Paul Castellano gets whacked for a lot of different reasons, but he was a greedy prick too. Greed is the worst thing. So if we've learned anything today about anything, it's that don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. That's the problem. People, people, and, and I'll use one last example and then I'm going to shut the fuck up and I'm done. Is that anything you ever get involved in in life, you're selling newspapers, you're selling donuts, whatever the fuck it is. If you go in with an expectation in a business that, all right, I know what my end is, it's going to be 10% of this, okay, fine. Well, let's say the guy gives you 9%. You want to whack him over that, over 1%? Some people are, ah, it's the fucking, the principle of the thing. Really, at the end of the day, no. For 1%, I'll walk, I'll take my money, fuck you, I never deal with you again. But when you start nickel and diamond, and your bottom line is money, 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 nonstop, which, of course, is the reason why you get involved in organized crime to begin with, is money. But when you take it to the next level, greed, and you're going to waste 100000 fucking dollars a day, a week, whatever the fuck it is, and then bitch and complain about the motherfuckers that are killing and making money for you, then I don't feel bad for what happens to you. I don't. All the pomp, all the stature, all the power, all the ego in the world means fucking nothing to me. It means nothing to me if you don't have respect to the people that are doing the work for you. That's the problem that a lot of these guys fucking forget. The minute they get fucking elevated, it becomes, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Fuck you. Stay under the fucking radar, make your fucking money, keep good business contacts, keep the business rolling, keep the money turning over. The minute you think you're above all that, it's jail or the bullet, and that's the end of it. And that's the end of it. All right, we'll be back next week with an all-new show, uh, large Q&A, and more stuff. In the meantime, if you can donate, please donate. $1, $2, $10, $100,000 if you want. Uh, everything goes to upgrading the system. It, up, it goes to upgrading computers uh, so that we can do a lot of other things. Uh, if you can donate, great. If you can't, I understand as well. I uh, want to thank all of those who do donate. It means a lot to me. Uh, it's nickels and dimes, guys. I'm not, I'm not getting rich off of nothing here. Uh, it's nickels, 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 dimes, and pennies. Uh, and all I do is roll it right back into what I do. 
Uh, other than that, you can check us out on Facebook at Mob Talk Radio. Submit your questions for the Q&A there. Uh, I think that's going to be it. We will be back next week with an all-new show, all-new topic, and we are going to start taking live callers. So I'm sure my fucking haters are, are fucking coming in their pants at that. Oh, I get to call him on the phone and call him a jerk off to his fucking face. Yeah, well, you know, so why not? Let's give him the opportunity to vent. Let's give him the opportunity to run that mouth. Uh, you know, and I'm sure that'll be fucking entertaining for those that love drama. All right. So all that being said, I wanted to thank everybody who continues to support the show. Everybody who follows me on YouTube. Uh, I appreciate the threats. <laughs> I appreciate the comments, the questions, and we're going to keep trying to bring you uh, the best content that we can. Other than that, have a great week, everybody, and we will see you next week.